My name's Chris Cleary, and when I was, uh, a little bit about me, and then I'll kind of jump off in a thing. Uh, so I was asked to come out here by Nico to talk about my recent experience uh, with Cyber Command. I just left Cyber Command not too long ago, and I had to tell Nico, I said, well, I really can't talk about Cyber Command specifically what I did or where I was or what I did while I was there, but I could maybe talk about the military planning process in the abstract uh, use some examples, and, and one of the things, and that's why that quote on there is, you know, plans are nothing, planning is everything. Uh, the military, we, we plan and execute operations, and that's sort of our, our, our backing, that's what we do. The community that, I'm, that we're trying to talk to, the community that now that cyber is the big buzzword and we're trying to figure out how to work through it is this community to try and figure out how we start bringing the two together, and that sort of leads into the next slide. There's a lot of talk about cyber warfare. Um, cyber warfare right now is kind of being made up of the hacker community and the military. Uh, the military spin on it right now and the way that we're trying to do business uh, is the, the policies that have come out. We released a new cyber policy and the five pillars of the things we're going to focus on is pretty much defensive in nature. Uh, and rightfully so. The military's job first and foremost is to defend, defend the United States uh, and also execute sort of missions that were directed to by you know, our senior leadership. The hacker community brings a whole new perspective to that because really, arguably, you guys were here first. Um, there's some things that the military's done for a long, long time that we're really good at. This is a new domain and we're trying to figure out how to operate in it. And it's kind of the bringing together of the peanut butter and the jelly to make something that we're going to coin cyber warfare in the beginning. And the, what I experienced in the last couple years is how the two communities may be talking past one another. The military, we're very rigid, we're very hierarchical, we do things very linearly. The hacker community is much more dynamic, much more free thinking, and it's trying to understand, and I, and I think when, when we bring these two closer together, uh, one of two things are gonna have to happen. Either the hacker community, when they wanna support the operations that we do, are gonna have to figure out our planning process and then f understand what they do and then bring it to us, or maybe we're gonna realize that the way that you guys do business and how those things will be brought to bear to support our operations, maybe we have to, in the military, come up with a new planning process, a new way of thinking through the, uh, a new language, a new, a new uh, way of stepping through it so that you guys can come and leverage what we do. Sure. All right, just a second. Good morning, everybody. How many people here are new to DEF CON? Raise your hands. Okay. For those of you who don't know, my name is Priest. For those of you who heard this, I apologize. I'm the designated asshole for DEF CON. I'm the mean man who's going to come find you when you're fucking up. Please don't fuck up. I really don't want to see you. We like it here. This is a nice venue. We love the guys where we were before, but like I said, this is a nice venue. I really don't want to be here Sunday saying, this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> that said, he's drinking light beer. That kind of scares me. It was bought for me. I didn't buy that. Somebody brought it to me, by the way. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good cover story. Yeah. Yeah. Good cover story. What I'm here to tell you, number one, is like I said, please don't fuck up. Number two, we are having something called the blood code drive. How many people here know what the Network Ninjas are? Or the Ninja Party? Raise your hands. Okay. For those of you who don't know, one of the most awesome parties at DEF CON is the Ninja Party. Their leader has come down with a rare blood disease. We're having a blood drive slash contest today from 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Doesn't matter what blood type you are. If you, will, if you could, please donate a pint of blood. Please be smart about it. Don't drink before. Don't drink booze after, rehydrate yourself. Don't go run a mile or something like that after you do it. But if you can do it, it would really not only help barcode, but it help everybody else who needs blood. There's a picture floating around a barcode. If you take a picture of yourself giving blood, there's a raffle going on. A couple of the prizes are, one is a skateboard signed by a lot of cool people. Two is we will take you on a behind the scenes tour of DEF CON. So we'll take you behind the green curtain and you get to see the little man pulling the levers. There's nothing back there. Uh, and like I said, we would really appreciate your help. They do a lot for us. Barcode, I know him personally, he's a really cool guy and would really help him out and would really help a lot of other people. 
who need blood. So there's a picture of me floating around. I was the first guy to do it. Let's see if we can't make a good, good showing at the, uh, at the blood drive. So that's it, guys. Thanks. Sorry. No, no worries. So I was just behind the green, cur green curtain a minute ago. There's really nothing back there. But uh, I got some beer and some finger food and stuff like that. But uh, um, So I wanted to kind of give a little bit about uh, how I got here and what I sort of learned along the way. And, and what I mean by that is sort of the progression of um, becoming a military planner. That, and something to learn from that is we're all sort of products of our environment. I mean, everybody in this room came from some different background. They have different experiences in their life that got them either to this room or to what they do. And, uh, you know, being a, being a planner was, is no different. Uh, so starting off, I, I started my career as a uh, maintainer working on F-18s, a uh, young kid working on a Hornets, it was really cool, it was a really cool job playing around it. But what I learned is, just because you know how to fix something, doesn't mean you know how to use it. Uh, from there, I went to, I actually got an opportunity to go to the Naval Academy, uh, and I played rugby, and although I got my ass handed to me pretty bad academically at the Naval Academy, I did pretty good in rugby. And one of the things you learn sort of at the academies is that with enough pressure, a round you know, peg will go into a square hole. So then I went to my first ship, I was a surface warfare officer, and uh, on my first ship I was the uh, anti-submarine and anti-surface warfare engagement officer, which means I either put torpedoes in the water or put harpoons in other ships. And when you got there, as a, as, again, as a planner or an executor, the lesson I took away from that was even though that you're, you're important to the mission, you don't necessarily know what the guy to the left and the guy to the right are, you are, are doing, but you do know that if they don't do their jobs, you can't do yours. Uh, from there, I went to, uh, I was the officer in charge of a landing craft detachment, worked with the Marines quite a bit, which is an experience all in itself. Uh, and I always said that you know, landing craft that mo a lot of people didn't even know we still have, because it was sort of a World War II era kind of thing. Uh, the good thing there was it was sort of like, being, it was an, I always tell everybody, it was an 18-month episode of McHale's Navy. It was the most fun I ever had. It was kind of like we were like pirates. We got to cruise around and just do goofy stuff with very little adult supervision. But... Uh, Working with the Marines, I found very, very painfully that when they say things are going to happen, it happens, and they happen to the minute. Uh, so the whole idea of being able to give in a set of orders and execute on a timeline is critically important to them because if you don't, people die. Landing craft in particular, the whole idea is you hit a beach as rounds are coming down, and you have to be there to the minute the rounds stop landing so the Marines have a safe environment to run under the beach. Uh, from there, I actually lateral transferred into the intelligence community. I went to the Office of Naval Intelligence for my first tour, and the idea was they were trying to, this is what started my technical background. Uh, they were trying to take intelligence officers, make us a little more cyber savvy, and then push us out into the environment. So when I showed up, and uh, I, I learned I was going to be doing this job sort of cold, uh, the network, the guy I was going to be working for in the IT division said, hey, you know, the Office of Naval Intelligence is a brand new building. We have the largest ATM network in the country. And I walked in, and I said, I only saw the one ATM in the lobby when I came in here. And the, and the guy literally turned and looked at me and he rolled his eyes and he was like, holy crap, are you kidding me? This is the guy who's going to be defending our networks. Uh, so they pumped just dollar into, I mean, I went to like every SANS class there was and these hacker courses, it just went completely over my head. But the idea was to learn how to speak the language, not necessarily be a keyboard operator, but just understand the environment. And as an officer, be able to take what you, again, what you guys are doing and the IT professionals are doing and sort of translate it to leadership, be the intermediary there. Uh, from there, because the market was so good, I ended up jumping out. I was in D.C. at the time and went to the private sector. I uh, went to go work for Spartan. I learned that it's, being a defense contractor is a much, much different world than being a military officer or in the government for that matter. Uh, their priorities are different. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they're in it to make money. Uh, and that's kind of the, the game you've got to play. This was uh, around the 06 time frame came around and the, the surge was getting to happen and as I was still a, a reservist, uh, I mobilized uh, and I went to the Joint Special Operations Command and everybody knows what those guys do now, uh, courtesy of uh, you know, us putting Bin Laden in the ground. But there were some things that I learned there. Uh, the JSOC community was a really, really cool community and I always said it was sort of being an outsider coming into it, it was sort of like being the water boy on a Super Bowl team. You know, uh, you got to be on the sideline, you got to see things, but you weren't going home with any of the cheerleaders after the game, and, uh, you know, you didn't get the ring, so you didn't get any of the credit. But also in that community, as an outsider, coming to the inside, even as help, you realize that there were communities within communities that you necessarily weren't a part of, uh, which sort of leads me, so from there I went back to the defense world, and then about two plus years ago, I got mobilized again to go to U.S. Cyber Command, and what I realized 
as a planner there that my background with all those different experiences really set me up pretty well. The, the most important one was the being an outsider and insider community. You know, what they do there, especially the people that support us, is still very much a click and you're not always necessarily allowed into that click. Uh, like I said, I, I just got back from Iraq too long ago and uh, you know, I feel a little more nervous in this room than I did when I was over there. But somebody in the audience would say, oh, Chris, you just got back. It got so much worse after you left. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but we were coining this kind of thing. And, and when I say one of these things is not like the other, as we're out there doing operations, uh, I read Rod Beckstrom's book, The Starfish and the Spider, and he talked about you know, the whole decentralized thing, and we're trying to put it in a different context. And we would start kicking around this idea of sort of the deer hunter and the sniper, especially, and I think it relates to this community pretty well. So deer hunters and snipers have some things in common, and for the most part, that's the weapon system they use. You can find a rifle, the exact same rifle that a marine sniper would use, the M40, such and such, 380 caliber, but so many grain bullet, and you could probably find a lot of deer hunters that are as good, maybe better at some times with that weapon system from hitting a target. You could set a, a, a plate out at 800 meters and probably put those guys right next to each other, and the, for the most part, they might be able to take that plate down. So in the execution of the tool, the execution of the weapon system, there might not be a lot of differences there. Where the differences come in is why they're trying to shoot that plate. And then I, I sort of put the pictures up there of the, the rifle scopes. You know, so the deer hunter's out there for one purpose and one purpose only. He's there to hit a deer, he's out there during deer season, he's wearing his hunter orange, and at the end of the day, he hopes he bags his limit so he can come home, take his you know, beef jerky or deer jerky or whatever he eats. I don't eat deer. Uh, and then, you know, feed his family. The military sniper, on the other hand, could be out there for a multitude of reasons. You know, even though he's looking through that guy through the scope, his job might just be to report that he's there. His job might be able to shoot him at a particular time that enables some operation afterwards. How he got there is another difference. Um, that particular military sniper, what if he's a Navy SEAL and he had a halo into the environment? The high altitude, low opening jump. Maybe he scuba in. Maybe he was delivered by a helicopter. Maybe he's been out there a week. Um, the, so the differences are not necessarily in their capabilities. It's in the planning that went through to get him to that environment uh, and why he's there. You know, his job might not be to pull that trigger at all. And I find that kind of in the community where we are now, when we talk about strategy and tactics, the military, the, the government's sort of working from the top down. Most of the conversations we're having right now are about big policy issues, big cyber strategy issues, you know, how we're going to try to use, strategy, use cyber in the future. And at the bottom, this community is really working on tactics. And, and I wouldn't go so far as to call them tactics, no offense to anybody in the room, but a, a tactic per, per joint pub, per definition, is something that's used in combat which is what makes the military very different, even from the intelligence community. Uh, and uh, that kind of leads into my next slide. Uh, so when I say those two things are not necessarily the same, these two things are not necessarily all that different. So you know, on the left of the slide, I got kind of the, the military, kind of what, what an operation center might look like, and on the right of the slide is a hacker doing certain things. And there's countries out there that are obviously leveraging the guy on the left a lot better than we are. Not that we should or shouldn't be doing that, and I'm up here definitely not advocating for, you know, sort of the citizen-soldier concept, but there are some countries out there who do necessarily advocate and push some of their hacker communities in that direction uh, to support operations. So when we start developing tactics, techniques, and procedures, which is, I know there's a lot of probably government military in the room who understand what those are, and there's sort of a hacker community that doesn't. The analogy that I use for that is, again, I, I like using the kinetic example of using maybe a firearm. And I imagine there's a lot of guys in this room that have shot a gun before. A procedure and a technique are the ways you would use that gun. So like, for instance, when you learn to fire a gun, a, a procedure is how to load it, how to clean it, how to strip it. And more importantly, if you're using it, say, in a combat situation, for round jams, how to, jam, how to unjam it very quickly and get back into the fight. A technique for using that gun might be how you hold it, kneeling, laying down, you know, guys who shoot pistols, there's the, you know, the isosceles stance and the weaver stance. That's a technique. A tactic is how that guy would use that gun in a combat situation with other people. And I think where this community starts uh, uh, needing to do a little bit better at is trying to figure out how a bunch of you guys operate together to sort of deliver some sort of effect or some end state. I know you capture the flag here where teams of guys work towards a common objective. Uh, and we've seen some other nations, some other prominent group, the, I guess the lull sex and the anonymous of the world sort of do things, at least with some sort of end state in mind. That's the way the military operates. Uh, but I want to talk about the, the offensive cyber thing, and I know that the, the brief was originally coined offensive cyber, and I want to get away from that for a minute for a couple of reasons. Not only do it was, you know, I'm not from Cybercom trying to, trying to uh, say that we, we should be doing offensive cyber, 
to try to explain to you what the military does or how we would use this capability uh, in the future. Well, we operate, the Department of Defense operates within a spectrum of conflict. And the reason I say that is because, you know, with those, with those blocks at the top, stable peace, unstable, insurgency, general war, you can look at the world right now and see that we're in one of those categories all over the place. Uh, and within each of those categories, we have operational themes. So as an example, one of the operational themes, peaceful military engagements. What we do, there's, you know, you'd say most of the countries in the world that we're in a, we're in a period of sort of a peaceful coexistence with, and especially our allies, our partners, um, we do training, we do, uh, uh, you know, recovery operations when we need to, things like arms control, counter drug. Uh, when we start moving up the, the level a little bit, limited intervention is actually the one I'd like to talk about the most and one that I'm going to talk about again, not to in the limited, uh, as I go through some more slides. But uh, a limited intervention is a, a specific operation to achieve an end state, a clearly defined end state limited in scope. Sort of those examples there, you know, a NEO is a non-combat evacuation operation. The Marines do those all the time. Go into an environment, maybe it's breaking down, you've got to get some American citizens out of there, how are they going to do it? Uh, strikes and raids. Strikes and raids, I think we're beginning to see now, and we might see more of, and as we start thinking through this, this, this might be how we classify these kinds of operations. I've got a slide coming up in a little bit where, we, where I talk about Stutznex, just as an example. Um, but I would classify that as a strike or a raid for whatever, for whoever did it, for whatever it was done, it was done with a limited scope to achieve a certain objective and then kind of end the operation. Uh, peace operations, kind of self-explanatory, there's lots of reasons we're in peace operations. Um, irregular warfare. Uh, again, on irregular warfare, you could see that kind of in, our, in uh, how we support either irregular warfare or go to fight irregular warfare. You know, Iraq and Afghanistan have sort of devolved into irregular warfare. They kind of came from major combat operations and sort of going backwards. And in the spectrum of conflict, the real, the military's goal is as we plan operations to execute through that spectrum of conflict is to take it from the right of that spectrum and bring it to the left. We're there to take uh, violent actions and bring them and hopefully by the time we leave, we're in a period of stable peace or at least we've left it better than we found it. I'm sure we could have a lot of arguments about the things that we're doing now and if we're gonna leave places better than we found them, but that's the idea, that's our intent, that's why we're going there. So within the whole spectrum of conflicts, you got the elements. Now I know this is kind of an eye chart and I apologize for that. And this is mostly for the people that afterwards who want to go through the slides and read through them a little bit more. But within any of those operations I just showed you on the last slide, the kind of things that we would do there uh, are represented here. So that you know, we have offensive, defensive, stability, and civil support operations. Now how you weight those, again, again going back to that last slide, uh, is what kind of makes that operation that operation. You know, obviously, to the right of the slide, in major combat operations, offensive things are the main reason we're there. You're there to, you know, we're the, we're the Department of Defense, and I used to get in this, this uh, argument with some of the other partner agencies we've worked for, and they'd, they'd look at us and they'd say, man, you military guys, all you want to do is break things. And I'd stand up there in my uniform and I'd go, well, yeah, that's, that's what we do, we break things. Uh, you know, you don't ask an F-18 pilot to drop picnic baskets in another country. He has, you know, he has kinetic weapons. Uh, he drops bombs and JDAMs and, you know, shoots down airplanes. That's what he does. That is his domain, and he's, his whole job is to get better at that. The idea was, so when we get into information operations, and, you know, CNO being one of the pillars of information operations, military planners, the guys who are going to plan in that environment, are thinking through how to support these kind of uh, uh, spectrum of conflict with a different, you know, operational themes. And when we're going to achieve some commander's end state in there, we're going to do things that leverage both offensive, defensive, stability, and civil support. So I guess what I'm trying to get people in this audience away from, or I wish the media would get away from this, is that as the cyber capabilities start to evolve, they're not just there for offensive reasons. We, we do those for a lot of different reasons. And now I'm going to break down some examples. You know, Shriver War Game. Shriver War Game is something that started a couple of years ago. I participated in it last, uh, last year. It's out here actually in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is a cyber slash cyberspace, space slash cyberspace war game where we get together with a lot of uh, uh, inner service partners, a lot of multi-agencies and, and multi-nations to come up with a war game, space, cyberspace, kind of all work through it, trying to leverage these others' capabilities to achieve some kind of end state, learn things about it. But, you know, it's done under the context of peaceful military engagement and for the most part with stability in mind. Uh, here's the Stuxnet thing I want to talk about and again, not knowing anything about Stuxnet, other than what I've read in the media, uh, what you could argue is there's somebody pissed off at the Iranians, 
And for whatever reason, they're, they're concerned about a particular capability that they had. And they came up, and in my mind, I'd call it a strike because it was limited scope. It was designed specifically with one thing in mind, and that was to degrade the Iranian weapons program uh, with no particular follow-on action, or at least none that, none that we've seen to date. Uh, but once it was executed and, and you could say completed, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was over. You know, like I said, to date, we've seen no follow-on action. But under the scope of limited intervention, it was something that, that whoever did it decided to do. Uh, Russia versus Georgia, we talk about this one all the time. Uh, and this is the first time when everybody wants to go to call cyber warfare. Oh, we saw the Russians do cyber warfare against the, uh, the you know, Georgia, Estonia, and one other country at the different times, different periods. But when you look at that, the actual cyber attack, most people in this room would say, well, it was a denial of service attack against some you know, government websites. Big deal. Well, yeah. But if you look through it in the context of whatever military planner put that together, what it was done, it was done to enable some other action. It was done to get the Georgians to turn their head for a minute and say, why is my banking system going down? And whoa, where'd that tank come from? You know, so when we talk about information operations, for the most part, information operations are done to enable other things. They're not done with the effect that we deliver there, whatever it is. And uh, when you talk about information operations, there's five pillars, MILDEC, PSYOP, computer network operations, um, OPSEC, and... Uh, one other, somebody help me, I'm sure somebody in the room knows what the fifth one is, it's escaping me right now. Uh, that's why we're there, that's why we do it. All right, so this next slide, before I hit the slide key, I'll take a sip here to calm my nerves. So before I hit the next slide, I gotta kinda intro the next slide for a minute. So talking about the military planning process is again why I came, I wanna kinda walk you through that and just get an understanding of what it, the, I'll, I'll call it the ass pain that military planners go through because it is not easy. Um, it is very painful, you get beat up quite a bit, uh, and it's, it's way harder than executing, and that's not to insult anybody who works on a keystroke on the other end of it, but it's the thing that takes, it's the longest pole in the tent, and if it's not done right, it's how things get effed up. Uh, and we've seen, we've seen good examples of operations, we've seen bad examples of operations, but it's the planning that makes that possible. So I wanted to walk you through an example, and because I couldn't really talk to a real world example, I have to talk to this one, okay, so pause for effect. All right. So, all right, so Live Free, Die Hard. First of all, I love this movie. Uh, I know when it first came out a couple years ago, it was, oh my God, the hacker. It was, uh, look, look what they can do. Look how effed up things are. Uh, and that was the first, the first context of looking at that movie, looking at it through the lens of only a, a cyber attack on the United States. But when you start breaking it down, and I, I start talking about, you know, I did this, did Hollywood do their homework? And once I became a planner and started thinking it through another context, if you take the cyber side away from it and you think of it just how that guy executed that operation, um, it, it actually it kind of makes for a nice case study. So first of all, the movie was based on an article, Farewell to Arms, written by this guy, John Carlin, who basically wrote an article talking about uh, the vulnerabilities of our critical infrastructure. And it was written like 10 years ago. So it was kind of, not I'm saying it was, wasn't an, ahead of its time, but it was written before critical infrastructure was really on everybody's lips. Uh, the movie itself, you know, focused on the execution. It was this uh, Thomas Gabriel, the bad guy, who went in and was taking down our infrastructure and, you know, the fire sale, all this other stuff. But when you, when you really look through the movie, uh, in my mind, it was a very well-executed well information operations campaign to achieve some end state. Now, of course, Bruce Willis gets involved. He fucks everything up and takes down the bad guy. But... Had Bruce Willis not been in the movie, this guy would have pulled off what he did. And if you looked at how he sequenced his operation, he actually did it in a pretty good way. And again, take, please take the, uh, the technical things that he did off the table. Let's just for a minute say that the technical side of the operation were possible. He sequenced them in such a way that he really, you know, he, they kind of pulled it off. So I say part of a bigger plan. And uh, I almost wish there could be a uh, Live Free, Die Hard prequel. I mean, nobody would go see it. There'd be a handful of people that would go see it. But it would be the kind of the recruiting of Thomas Gabriel to pull off this operation against the United States. Because everybody's seen the movie, right? I can't imagine there's anybody who hasn't seen the movie. All right, good. I didn't want to have to explain the movie. But, uh, you know, in the beginning, after, they enter, after they, you find out who Thomas Gabriel is, basically you find out he's a disgruntled government employee who tried to show the government how screwed up the, uh, our security was. And, of course, he's blackballed and thrown into the wild. And then all of a sudden he's executing this operation. I'm like, holy shit, where'd he get all that stuff? Where'd he get that truck? Where'd he get those helicopters? You know, where did those, where did those French ninjas come from? Those, you know, that guy had to have some bank. He had to have some funding. Um, 
the, and the beginning of the movie does a, does a kind of a, a decent job, at least it's only in the credits, it's only in the first three seconds of when they're going out and they're, they're kind of got that computer screen and they, you know, we have access to defense, access to financial, access to transportation. I'm like, okay, so they kind of hinted it a little bit, what we'll call the preparation of the battle space going into the movie. But holy crap, that guy had to have a ton of money and to pull all that stuff off, I mean, for guys of you in this audience who do this stuff, you know that that of all those things that they were trying to access, that would have taken years to execute that operation. Um, not only from a financial point, but you know, the access and the sequencing and the rehearsal, all that other stuff, it just wasn't done on the fly. So I always say, and I hope there's no French in the room, but I, I thought it was like, oh, so if the movie could have been, he was approached by the French, here's some French ninjas, it'll be your muscle, we'll give you your money, and yeah, we want you to destabilize the United States of America, and oh, by the way, you'll get to take all that money home, but if you looked at the movie in the context of a much bigger campaign, it would have been the operation to destabilize the United States. And there was probably some follow-on action uh, after he conducted that operation that maybe there was another sequenced operation that was going to happen behind it, you know, the next movie. What was the thing that was going to happen after this guy brought the government to kind of its knees for the most part? So when you start thinking about how they did that, again, I chart, and I apologize for this, you know, operational design. Planners live in this world. Planners take commander's intent run them through a bunch of filters and come up with some plan on the other end. And for those, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room that are familiar with this, uh, and I'm sure there's some, uh, some people that aren't. From a planner's perspective, this is our, this is our TCP IP stack. See, so I, know, I know a little bit of, a little bit of technology. So when I sit through most of the conferences in here, it goes right over my head. You know, technology, I'm like, oh, one, zero, whatever. And I would expect some of the planning process for people who aren't familiar to go over your head. Um, and just from, a, you know, from an abstract perspective, wow, why do they have to do those things that doesn't make sense to me? In the beginning, I don't, I don't disagree with you. But when you, when you become a planner, and what I would argue is there's a lot of people out there that, are, that think there are planners. And I thought I was a planner when I showed up just on the fact that I was a military officer that had done amphibious landings and done you know, harpoon engagements. And yes, there is a planning perspective to that. But it's not military joint operation planning and execution planning, which is a whole different animal. And you kind of learn that the painful way, the first time you go to present something and they ask you a million questions, you're like, oh, I didn't think of that, and you get beat up. So as you look at that slide from sort of the left to the right, you know, operational art, that operational art we coined in the military is, is based on your experience um, and based on the way that you kind of know certain capabilities work and certain things work together, you're able to use that, put some plans together that kind of make sense and throw them out the other side to your leadership to, to buy off on. One of the things that, that we're finding out in cyber is it's difficult for us military planners to understand this new capability, which is why it, it becomes painful at times, not only for the reasons it's hard to explain to military leadership what it is that you guys do, but it's also difficult for us to quantify the effects of what you guys do, which makes leadership a little bit hesitant to maybe execute on operations. So when you start doing sort of this mission analysis, you get into this effects-based planning. And what that is is on the right side of the slide, you sort of see the military end state, which uh, is what you want done. You know, what are you trying to do? And as I'm going to kind of relate this back to the movie, I'm going to kind of jump between planning and jump between the movie. Uh, military end state, if you, and I got another slide to talk to this in a second, uh, was, you know, destabilize the United States or ultimately in the movie it was he was going to get into Woodlawn and steal all the, uh, the financial data that was being backed up there. Well, to do that, knowing that the end state is you got to look at your target and I'm going to move to the right side again and go to center of gravity. Center of gravity analysis is something that takes the most time for what we're doing because that ultimately leads us to where we want to deliver our effects. Uh, center of gravity usually, so... Uh, Clausewitz defines it as, you know, the hub of all power movement on which everything depends. So when you break that down, a center of gravity, you get critical capabilities. And you can do this in a lot of different ways. And maybe just for an example, we'll say like a, uh, you know, an air defense system. Well, an air defense system, it's critical capabilities. It's got the missile, it's got the launcher, it's got the radar. Uh, and the radar's broken in, you know, it's got to detect radar, track radar, fire control radar. It's got people, it's got power. Those are all the things that make that system operate. Well, based on that, it's got critical requirements. Each one of those systems and has requirements that makes it function. You know, the radar needs power. It needs people. Uh, the missile needs a view of the horizon. You know, there's a lot of different things that, that it would need. And then when you start looking at the critical requirements, you start identifying critical vulnerabilities. And the vulnerabilities are to take down any of those critical capabilities to that would affect the center of gravity. So an example of, you know, the radar. If I can destroy the tracking radar because it's physically loaded, located somewhere, which again makes it vulnerable to attack, I'm able to take the 
the weapon system offline and I maybe never had to hit the missile or never had to go out to the people. Or if I can keep the people from getting to the site to operate it, well, then the site can't operate. So there's a lot of different ways we think through that. But as we start piecing it together, when we've identified our critical vulnerabilities, those become our objectives. Those become the things that we're trying to target, the things we're trying to deliver our effects to. So our, and our effectives then, um, our objectives, we assign an effect to it. And in the most case, in the Title 10 world, which is very important to distinguish, the effects become degrade, deny, destroy, disrupt, defeat. And that's the way, you know, we're there to break it or deliver an effect to, do, to do, again, degrade its ability to operate. And that effect will then become a task. Hey, your task is to deliver this kind of capability against this target to degrade this thing. And it's kind of a, and you get into an OODA loop where they, one continues to support the other. Which leads us into the joint operations planning process. Uh, for those in the room who do, who are familiar, who have participated in it, uh, you realize just how painful this is. Uh, this is for a planner, uh, a lot of sleepless nights, um, a lot of getting yelled at by very senior people, and a lot of hair pulling out to junior people to get them to try to understand what you're doing. You know, bringing a lot of people to the table to kind of for a uh, uh, common purpose. You know, it, 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 and again, the thing to understand from the, from the hacker community is this is very linear. Uh, you know, you get some commander that says, I need you to do X. And then you take that, that uh, task you've been given and you go into a mission analysis phase and you all sit down with the guys at your pay grade and you're like, holy crap, how are we going to do this? Uh, and you start thinking of all the different things you need to execute. And then once you have some of your facts, and I've got some slides that talk about this in detail, you know, to develop COAs, you war game it out, and obviously something gets approved and but not all the time executed, which is the other thing to understand. You, even planners plan, we plan all the time. That's all we do. I mean, there's somebody somewhere right now probably planning to invade Canada because they've got nothing better to do, but that's what we do. So when you look at the, so the mission analysis, again, which I said is the most painful part of the process, uh, this is when you're trying to piece together what you're trying to do. And then trying to revert back to the movie, I, I call it some things in red to say, you know, when Thomas Gabriel, was approached by the French, so I'll jump into that for a second, and was asked to go do X, Y, and Z. Well, he, he's thinking, okay, if he wants me to go do this and they're gonna let me you know, do this fire sale, how I'd go about doing it. And he came up with some, you know, some implied and essential tasks. Uh, and he really had to look at our center of gravity or his adversary's center of gravity and what makes us tick. And when he was going through this, and I'll, I'll bring it up in a second, he really determined that if he could get to the U.S. government and kind of bring them to her knees, it would enable him to do something else. Uh, commanders, the CCIRs, if you're not familiar, that's Commander's Critical Information Requirements. Again, if this was the prequel of the movie and he was trying to execute on this, his list of information requirements probably would have covered this whole wall because you guys all know from the community all the different targets he was trying to hit and all the different ways to get in there would have just been, you know, a laundry list of things that he would have taken probably more like years to get his hands on. Not to mention who built the truck, all the other stuff, the money, the spec requirements to build a truck out, the helicopters, the French ninjas, all that stuff uh, took a lot of time. So again, so if we look at the same slide, the mission to task kind of construct for uh, his center of gravity analysis, you know, he was going after the United States government, which, is, which was the target. You, our capabilities there, you know, banking, law enforcement, first responders, all the things that make a government function. The critical requirements to that are, you know, so you got financial, you got banks, you got communications, you know, you got telecoms. Uh, so you, you know, you can see the things on the slide. And then the critical vulnerabilities, what he was going after, because there were so many different targets, I just kind of sum up here. There were, you know, obviously physical vulnerabilities he was going after, technical vulnerabilities, and it's sometimes procedural vulnerabilities. Things that he could he could initiate that just through procedure drove his target to do something. And I have a slide that lays that out in a second. And then his, of course, as he went through the movie, he said, well, well to do that, I'm going to target critical infrastructure uh, with, the, with the effects being to, depending on the critical infrastructure, disrupt, disgrade, destroy at some point. You know, he blew up the, uh, well, it was a kind of a, I call a follow-on mission when he blew up the uh, power plant to try and kill uh, Agent McLean. Um, he sequenced to an event, and then, like I said, the tasks varied by target. So co-development. This is where kind of where the rubber meets the road. So now you've, you've, you've gone through your mission analysis. You've gone back to your boss and say, hey, boss, you told me to do this. This is what I think you told me to do. Do you still agree with that? And he'll go, yeah, I told you once. Okay, thank you for repeating back to me what I just told you to do, which sometimes really pisses them off. Uh, and then you start getting into a COA, and you'd be presenting these COAs back to him. And, and I have a slide on what makes a COA a COA. Uh, and to do that, you know, 
when you, co is, and we say that, you know, adequate, feasible, acceptable, distinguishable, because you, you always bring the, you got to bring the boss more than one option. And those options have to be somewhat different so you can, you know, uh, pick one. And, and sometimes I like the joke, I mean, you guys seen the Simpsons movie when he puts all the, the co's in front of him and he kind of leads them to the one that he wants them to pick. Uh, that's kind of done too because you'll say, hey, sir, these are all your co's, but this is really the one we think you should go with. And, you know, you paid us to do this job and we think we're, we're somewhat smarter than you. Go with this one and some, for the most part, this will do or they'll modify them or send you back. It just becomes painful. But if you have to think about, again, back to the movie, what he was trying to do, uh, the objectives, and did I build this already? Uh, the major forces requirements. So now that he's figured out what he had to do and how he wants to do it, that's when he would have gone back and said, hey, French overlord, the guy who asked me to do this, I need to build this truck. I need this kind of access. I'm going to need a lot of walking around money because I need to buy people uh, on the inside to either write code for me or give me access. You know, I need a big, I need some, uh, you know, walking around money. And then he would have gone back and said, hey, but for me to execute all this, this is the kind of time I'm going to need two years or six months or whatever his time frame was. And then based on what, let's say, your commander was trying to do, sir, we'd like to do that, but it's going to take us six months. He might say, well, you don't have six months. I might have to go to another kind of operation because t time is of the essence. Or if time is not of the essence, we'll allow you to execute. I think if you look at the Stuxnet as an example, and Wired Magazine wrote a really good article on this, you know, way back when, when reportedly the Israelis asked the Americans for a, you know, a kinetic bomb to do it, and they, we said no, they said, ah, oh, crap, well, we need another way to do this. If, well, I'm not saying it was the Israelis, but uh, whoever, whoever did it, so I yeah, strike that from the record. Um, uh, whoever did it, they said, hey, some cyber geeks, sorry, no offense to anybody in the room, said, hey, we've got this way of maybe trying to do this. It's got a long lead time. It's going to take a lot of time to execute, and we've got to do all these steps. And somebody said, well, yeah, time is kind of on our side, so go ahead, run with it. But I can tell you, whoever was planning on doing whatever probably had some follow-up operation just in case that didn't work, and in case time got of the essence that there was some probably follow-on action to deliver the same kind of effect. Um, from there, you get to, you take all your COAs, and then you start wargaming them out. Uh, and then, you know, with these potential uh, decision points and branches and sequels, that's really important because every, every, everything you're going to try and execute in, uh, you'd need, if it doesn't work or if it doesn't go down the way you want, you have to have some kind of uh, follow-up position or you've got to stop the operation. Excuse me. Uh, let's see, and based on that, then I'm going to kind of walk you through what I call Gabriel's plan. And this is, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road in the sense that whenever you're trying to accomplish something and, you, and you've got... Your, your commander's end state and you've got your, hey, this is how I think we're going to accomplish it. Then you've got to sort of sequence it because what you find is, is the sequencing of the operation is really what makes the operation the operation. And I say that's sort of the difference between maybe this community, I'm saying the hacker community and the military is, is again, we're very hierarchical, we're very linear, we do things, one thing's after another because that's the way we do business. So again, going back to the movie, I kind of carved the movie up into three major lines of operation. The first one was sort of I'll call house cleaning. And that was, hey, what else, what are the final things I need to execute on the operation? And, uh, you know, he was killing off all his help because he didn't want those guys screwing things up. Um, the next one was the fire sale because in the movie they sort of coined, that's what the government, you know, halfway through the movie thought was going on. It was a major terrorist attack to take down our infrastructure and just screw things up uh, just because somebody was disgruntled at us and they wanted to, uh, you know, bring down the United States. With the third line of operation being Woodlawn, and if you guys remember the movie, Woodlawn was really the re whole reason he was there. It wasn't necessarily to do the fire sale, it was to enable his, his ability to get access to Woodlawn and steal that, off that information. The fire sale was what he just kept everybody busy with so he could execute something else, which is why I coined this as a information operations. He used non-kinetic effects to enable his end state or his kinetic operation. But in the movie, which was also cool, he, he would synchronize kinetic and non-kinetic things at the same time to enable one another. So as we start moving through the operations and the different phases, uh, phase zero was all his prep that he was doing to finish the environment. You know, he was collecting all his last, his, uh, last intel, getting his last source code. And then he started tying up all his loose ends before he executed. And that's when he's killing off all those programmers because those are the guys that the loose ends, if I leave them lying around, maybe they'll screw me up which, of course, you know, stealing the punchline, everybody who's seen the movie knows that's exactly what happens with, you know, Bruce Willis's help, of course. 
So he eventually got to a certain point where he said, hey, I'm ready to execute the operation. I think I've done my leading into it. I'm ready to go. And, uh, you know, he executes phase one, and the first thing he does is he attacks transportation. And at that point, people just see it for what it is. Wow, it's a big transportation glitch. They're not putting two and two together. But eventually it's, well, wait a minute. Traffic goes down here, and the FAA is reporting something over here, and Amtrak went down over there. Whoa, this is not, this is not a, uh, a coincidence. You know, we're under attack, and they, they, they label it as under attack, and people start freaking out. Um, he moves from there, I thought the nice line, he says, oh, let's get him outside for some fresh air, and he goes after the anthrax alarms. And when he sets off the anthrax alarms, now everybody's getting out of the building again. It's a, it gives him some more breathing room. It gets the government out of the building. It allows him to, I think he displaces at this point. He moves from one point, one place to another. It gives him some time and space to get ready for his next thing. But what you learn later in the movie is that was a very specific uh, operation required to achieve his end state. They also show that scene, you jump to the Social Security Administration, it doesn't mean anything at the time, and they show people leaving that building. That, you know, he, that's one of the buildings he needed to evacuate, because that was really his target. But when all the buildings evacuate, that doesn't really mean anything to the government, because everybody just left their buildings. So where's the target? So once he evacuates that building, now he, he goes for after a kinetic operation, which uh, he goes in and he seizes the building. The people are all out. He, it's a you know, relatively limit light, it's on security, puts his goons in there, his goons go take down all the security guards, and then prep for his next operation, which means I'm in, the, I'm in that server room, I've downloaded my malware, I'm ready to start receiving the download, which executes stage two. Stage two was he goes and he attacks the financial market. Now from the fire sale line of operation, it makes a lot of sense. It's the fire sale, oh, everything must go, we're gonna go after financial, we're gonna go after power, we're gonna go after electric. So under that line, and the government's thinking is, wow, this is just a big, huge cyber attack. This is just a big, huge terrorist attack on the United States. But in his operation, that was required because that's what's triggered the download from the financial district to his target, where his guy was waiting to receive the payload. And in here, we'll talk about our first branch or sequel. So as a military planner, I'd say, well, that has to happen. That download from from the Wall Street to my target has to happen. And if I can't do it non-kinetically to support the fire sale, I might have to have a sequel set up to do it kinetically. So maybe in the movie, if that didn't work, he had some kinetic strike, a uh, bombing on Wall Street, a uh, attack on a, something in that area that would have had the same effect. And he would have had guys on call to say, hey, you know, that failed. We're going to go to sequel one, which is the kinetic attack on Wall Street, again, to drive the same operation. Because if that didn't happen, yeah, the fire sale would have gone down. It would have looked like a terrorist attack. And it might have enabled the, uh, let's say, the French's plan to destabilize the government. The fire sale would have gone through. But his whole plan then of being able to go to Woodlawn and steal that information would have failed. So at, at our point, if that doesn't happen, the, oper the operation for the most part is a failure. So then he, the download begins, you know, this, he gets this download at 20% kind of thing, and at that point is when the decision's made to send his girlfriend out to the power plant facility and take it down. Now I watched the movie three or four times, and I'm like, why the hell did he take down the power? It doesn't make any other sense. And then it kind of hit me as, well, it's the, sort of the trifecta on the fire sale. It sets the rest of the fire sale down, which would, again, I, in my opinion, I think he did that to sort of cover his tracks. I'm going to do the fire sale. It makes sense. They're expecting it. It's one of those things they'll think will go. And it's going to take them so long to figure out that why I was really here was to get into Woodlawn, was to steal this information. And before you figure any of this out, I'm going to be gone in Paris, more than likely, uh, you know, hanging out with all my money. But at the end of the day, you know, the mission wasn't complete. And why wasn't it complete? Because in my opinion, he didn't do his work on his first line of operation, which says, you know, other than the fact that I know that this line of operation is supposed to kill all these bad guys, I don't think he thought through it enough with a proper sequel in place that said, if something horrible goes down, I might have to put a lot more effort into tying up my loose ends. He doesn't. McLean gets in there. McLean, you know, screws everything up and it kills the operation. So if you think of that in a sequenced event from an I.O. planner, that's how we would have to present to our leadership a campaign. Leadership would have said, yeah, go ahead. That makes sense to me. Execute. Uh, so as I'm kind of getting the hook to get off the stage, I want to I leave with this. Everything I just said is in joint pubs. Um, and for those of you who kind of want to learn more about the way the, the military operates, you know, go check out these joint pubs. They're all there. Actually, some of them come in little cliff notes. Uh, they're online. And for those of you who want to sequence operations or, or figure out how you're going to enable certain things, again, understanding how the military operates is sort of really important to the, the subject. And then I think when you come to us understanding our process as we try and make realms, you know, come into conferences like this, understand your processes, 
uh, we'll start taking, you know, things that take weeks and months and years, and maybe we'll start getting them down to days and hours or minutes. Um, and with that, uh, that's the end of my talk. I hope you guys liked it, and I guess I'll be across the hall for questions.